the basic assumption that only two kinds of interests or entities operate in the area of political action. That is, individuals and the government. There have been numerous books published with such titles as Man versus the State. I know two of those. They both appeared, I think, in 1906. We hear about big government as a threat to the individual, and so forth and so forth. Conservatives now are telling us that we must curtail government, cut government spending, cut government powers, reduce government personnel for the sake of making individuals more free. Liberals, on the other hand, are still telling us, as they have for a long, long time, that in order to make individuals free, we must destroy communities. By communities, I mean villages, ghettos and cities, ethnic groupings, religious groupings, anything which is segregated, we must destroy them so that all individuals would be, if possible, identical, including boys and girls. But the area of political action, and I won't draw it on here, but just assume a circle of political action in which you have government individual acting in there. But you also have at least two other groups, really three others, voluntary associations, which I'll say no more about, corporations, and communities. And if the liberals destroy communities for the sake of the individual, and the conservatives destroy big government for the sake of individuals, you're going to have an area of political action in which irresponsible and immensely powerful corporations are engaged in opposition to individuals who are socially naked and independent. Hello, I'm McDo Brothers back again for another program. The clip that you just heard was from Carol Quigley in his 1976 lecture at Georgetown. In it, he discusses or describes how the right and the left strip power from individuals and leave them vulnerable to the corporate oligarchy in the United States. This clip sets the tone for the series of videos of which this will be an introduction to called Feminized America. No means no. Yes means yes. Violence against women. Sexual harassment on the job. Verbal harassment on the street. Rape culture. All these terms are familiar to every man in America. These terms and policies make up the fabric of a feminized America. From the billionaire, the athlete, the politician, down to the average Joe and the bum on the street. All men are affected by these policies. Even the little boy in kindergarten cannot escape this. And the fact that all males are held under the scrutiny and suspicion by feminized America. Men are considered guilty until proven innocent in the court of public opinion. The slightest slip of the tongue can put a man into PC hell. He can lose his reputation, his money, and his job. The attitudes and policies over the last 50 years have upset the fabric of the society. These things have turned the male-female dynamic on its head and forever upset the balance between men and women. What used to be a benevolent patriarchy has become a vicious matriarchy hostile not only to men, 
but to male children. It has created an alpha female beta male dynamic. The result has been a high percentage of divorce, a low percentage of marriages, dysfunctional families, massive out of wedlock births, and one out of every two children raised in a single parent household. To understand the social fabric that we live in, we have to go back to when the fabric was first woven. Back to the 1930s New Deal under FDR. FDR was our first pro-socialist president. Because of the Great Depression and the harshness of capitalism, there arose amongst the people a great dissatisfaction. It had to be dealt with. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt adopted European liberal socialism to satisfy the masses and quell a potential uprising. Social programs like Social Security, aid for families with dependent children, and housing projects were started. Under FDR, the U.S. undertook a massive redistribution of wealth and satisfied the masses for a time. These policies, along with the outcome of World War II, allowed America to experience an almost golden age. Peace and prosperity reigned among the masses. The middle class expanded and a lot of social ills were dealt with. There was peace among the classes. With social harmony at home, America was able to expand its empire and influence globally. Pax Americana became the global mean and it was enforced by the satisfied Americans Romes who carried out the policy. For the next 30 years, America was in relative social peace. Marriage rates went up. There was a baby boom. Suburbs grew. All was well. Then came the 60s. The baby boomers came of age and the willing drones of the World War II generation gave way to the questioning and discontent of the baby boomers. The 60s were full of social unrest. This all culminated with the protest against Vietnam in 1968 to 70. In 1968 in Chicago, the socialist left order was overturned. Two years later, under Richard Nixon, the protest against the policy on Cambodia culminating with the incident at Kent State and the National Guard firing on students, the conservative right order was also overturned. A new policy to pacify the masses would have to be found. On May 4th, 1970, the incident at Kent State shocked the nation. The anti-war protests had reached a crescendo. The baby boom generation was angry and fed up. Could this be 1968 all over again? Two months later in July, the legislation that would eventually become Title IX was introduced into committee. Coincidence? Title IX and the policy of equity was the first step away from the old patriarchy. It was a systematic social engineering of women and girls, but it especially addressed the problematic males of the baby boom generation. Title IX and its sister companions slowly spread out and systematically took power and control out of the hands of males and placed it into the hands of females. The feminist policies we have become familiar with were born from this legislation. Shepherded along by both right and left, it had the desired effect of satisfying the females and pacifying the males, making willing drones of both. As with any social instrument, Policies have a tendency to go beyond its intended effect and morph into an institution. It takes on a life of its own. So too has Title IX and the feminist agenda of equity gone beyond its intended effect of empowering females and pacifying males. It has morphed into an institution that lives, breathes, and operates for its own sake and not that of the society. The institution of feminine equity 
in its desire to expand its own power and its own importance has grown from being contentious to draconian and now it threatens to upset the balance in society and rip the fabric that society is made from. So what do you get when you design and socially engineer a policy that runs counter to the way human beings have worked for thousands and thousands of years? What do you get when you socially engineer boys and girls to operate opposite their nature? You get what we have now. You have a breakdown of society and you have people, men and women, rebelling against something that they don't feel is natural to them. 